Uh, Lord Clark, I've said on a number of occasions that your involvement in, as Minister of State for Health in the period 82 to 85 and the issues in which, which the inquiry is investigating was minimal. And I just wanted to uh, uh, see if I... I haven't said minimal, but I was, what I've said, going, going, everybody alters what I say, I guess, on the reporting of it. What I've said is I was never the minister directly responsible for the subject. Uh, and if I can just then go through with you various issues and, and, and ascertain that you had, um, in, whether or not you had involvement in them, um, uh, um, really by way of summary. So you, in relation to the, the production of the donor leaflet in 1983, you were involved in I involved that. I, inv I intervened then and involved myself, as I explained, because I was worried that we might destroy trust in the uh, blood transfusion service if we did it we, you know, if we got the tone wrong and overdid it, uh, not, not so much us, it was if we spun things into the newspapers who were being sensational, I didn't want to have an adverse effect on the supply of donors, or even worse, to have patients lose confidence in the safety of the blood transfusions they were getting. Um, you were involved in the saga of the revised donor leaflet 1984 to 5. Again, we've explored Yes, and I obviously intervened. I wasn't in charge of it. But I intervened because I wanted to check that we, we weren't doing anything that would accidentally cause problems to the blood transfusion service. In relation to the um, Council of Europe recommendations, those certainly came across your desk and you made some uh, contributions. Yeah, but they were a footnote matter. I mean, I, if they came across my desk, I don't remember it. I'm sure I got copied it. In terms of the redevelopment of BPL, your um, involvement was, I think, as follows. Uh, um, you gave various public statements in which you updated or was... I did answer of the, uh, on behalf of other ministers in the House of Commons sometimes. And you became involved on the financial side in relation to the cost... I, I got concerned about the cost control. That's the only, my only role with the Blood Products Laboratory. And it was a very brief intervention because the permanent secretary, once he'd found out that the costs were going up rather rapidly, took over and no doubt sorted it out. You were involved um, in um, some, part of the some parts of the consideration uh, given to the uh, introduction of HIV screening in the blood, into the blood supply. We, we looked at that yesterday. Uh, I'm, I, I was aware of it, but I don't call I did anything. I, I, did I? Well, I don't take, want to go over the same ground. I don't think I did any thought. action on it. I don't think anything I did made any difference. Well, you'll recall, I think, the, there was the decision about central funding or regional health authority funding. Oh, where we got the money from. I, there are several things I was involved in that. Yeah. You raised questions about whether, uh, uh, in your challenging role, as it were, whether there was a need for it. I asked one question in, what is it, 30,000 documents. There's a sentence saying one of the questions I asked was, do we need both? And presumably I was told yes. Uh, um, uh, on the issue of... Um, uh, um, public articulation of the government's line to take of no conclusive proof. You were involved in, in that on the two uh, occasions. Line to take notice of? No conclusive proof, no conclusive evidence. You were involved in relation to yes, that. Yes, I, 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 I'd love to, I, The reason I'm exasperated is the Times this morning has a headline saying I said something about that, which I did not say. I didn't say no conclusive proof meant safe. No conclusive proof says there was a possibility, it might even be a probability, but we could not be certain and sure. I mean, no conclusive proof is not the same as saying it's safe. The whole reason for putting a leaflet out was we had doubts about the safety of taking blood from homosexuals. I mean, what's got me in a bad mood this morning is the Times has a headline saying I said something, which I didn't. I mean, it's complete, there's no relation to what I said yesterday. And, I'm sure you'll agree, we took long enough over it yesterday. They, somebody, they could have listened and got it you know, vaguely right. And then on the question of the banning or restricting the importation of concentrates, the evidence would suggest that neither you nor any other minister, including the responsible minister, uh, were asked to take any decisions in relation to that. The banning of? The banning or restriction of American factor eight that never came across, it would appear, your death. No, so or, that, 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 I mean, that's presumably most of your questions, I assume, are being aimed at the doctors who treat patients. That's what I hope you're spending most of your time on, because I'm sure they can explain the decision they took on the balance of risk not to stop prescribing factor eight. I mean, they're far more important to all this than ministers. Uh, rest assured, Lord Clark, we've spent a considerable period of time questioning doctors.
Um, if we go then to, sorry, it's your witness statement. Let me just check which one. Yes, if we go to your second witness statement, so assume it, that's W-I-T-N, thank you, you don't need to be asked, um, and we go to page 93, um, you were asked um, to, uh, as it were, reflect on um, at the government's uh, um, response to the risks posed by infected blood and blood products. And in paragraph 70.2, you say, as a department, I believe we acted as swiftly and as efficiently as we were able, given the clinical and legal advice made available to us. Does that remain your view, Lord Clark? Yes. Uh, if we go over the page uh, to um, paragraph 71.5, um, you say, finally, I've been asked whether there are any lessons to be drawn from the infected blood crisis which are applicable today. And then you answer it, as I understand it, in the following paragraphs by saying, whilst I would hope that a comparable crisis never occurs again and lessons have been learnt in relation to blood products, looking back at my time in office, I believe the government and Department of Health at the time acted as best they could given the circumstances once we were made aware of the risks associated with imported blood products, officials acted expeditiously, expeditiously to neutralise the risk through heat treatment and sourcing other products and provide evidence on transmission. And um, no doubt comparisons will be drawn between the infected blood crisis and the COVID pandemic and more specifically the way in which the governments of the time dealt with the respective risks uh, they faced. And then you say you can't speak with any authority in relation to the present government's decision making. Is it right to understand then that in terms of your own perspective looking back, you're, you have not identified any lessons to be learnt uh, from the infected blood crisis? No, I haven't. Uh, I mean, I've obviously <laughs> improved my knowledge better now than it was two and a half days ago, because I've uh, been taking through all these documents uh, again, so I'm all the time discovering more about what the department actually did, or being reminded, I mean, now read a second or third time, some of these documents, which I, I had never seen in my life before, most of them. Um, uh, I, I, I don't see, but if this was a normal legal proceeding, we'd have pleadings. Uh, and that would involve setting out what it claimed the department should have done that it didn't do, what the basis of any criticism or claim was. As far as I'm aware, you, two and a half days, no one's raised any allegation anybody failed to do anything or anything like that. But I, if they do, I or the person who took the decision or the doctor concerned, no doubt will answer it. I can't answer for everything that happened because I wasn't involved in most of it uh, during the time I was there, in the key years when I was Minister of State for Health. You know, I'm not the right person to ask most of these questions. If we look at the top of the page, oh, it's there actually on the screen, where you say in that sentence at the top of the screen um, that officials acted expeditiously, um, and then if we skip over the next bit, to provide education on transmission. Sorry, so what sorry where, where, where's this? So it's the top, the, hopefully the top of the screen. Once we were made aware of the risks associated with imported blood products, officials acted expeditiously to neutralise the risk through heat treatment and sourcing other products. I'm not asking you about that, Lord Clark. And to provide education on transmission. To what are you there referring? What education on transmission are you talking about? I'm not sure, actually, quite honestly. That is an odd way of putting it, isn't it? Um, to... to uh, uh, I mean, it's on AIDS we gave education on transmission, which again, is, it's just an odd phrase I've chosen there. Uh, it's uh, we, obviously, there was a big AIDS campaign, which Norman Fowler will tell you about, uh, which was making clear that both heterosexuals uh, and homosexuals should seek to protect themselves and that it was largely transmitted by sexual transmission. And in the, uh, you know, that I have left out, but they also did, which we did spend some time on, which is this, which the leaflet's relevant to, we did stop, uh, we tried to minimise the risk of the blood we were collecting, and we stopped, we tried to stop having blood donated by homosexuals, rather sweepingly, all homosexuals, we don't do that anymore, nowadays we do take blood from homosexuals. But, uh, and if we go back to page 93... 
paragraph 70.2, second sentence, where you say, as a department, I believe we acted as swiftly and efficiently as we were able, given the clinical and legal advice made available to us. Um, Lord Clark, how is it that you are able to reach that conclusion, given uh, the following three factors? One, your repeated assertion that you were not the minister responsible. Two, your lack of independent memory now of the events and decisions in question. And three, the fact that you're unfamiliar with most or much of the documentation. Well, insofar as, I mean, the things that I've been made aware of, the documents by the evidence, I agree. I mean, that's a perfectly fair question. But you ask me what my opinion is, and insofar as I've been involved, and involved in the follow-up and the inquiries, and you know, sometimes in, involved by the campaigning, I, I've not so far had anything revealed to me which says that the department did not act efficiently, and, and everything, the whole everything depends. It's true of all these inquiries, which we now set up so regularly. With hindsight, of course you can see things that we would do and would have done had we known the eventual outcome. What I'm addressing myself in this, this was in response to questions, all this. I was being asked to answer the very things which your question now suggests I shouldn't answer. The question, given the medical knowledge at the time, did anyone behave carelessly or negligently? And all I can say is personally, insofar as the areas I, I've now seen or I've been involved in, no, I don't think anybody, I can't, I can't see anything where I think anybody in the department should have acted differently. And anyway, as I keep saying, the department's not the principal player here. I mean, and the thing that's useful, that people who took the key decisions were the haemophilia specialists giving the, the treatments. It was a clinical issue. It was a balance of risk. And, and you must ask the haemophilia consultants why they stopped giving factor VIII when they did, but not earlier. Now, what little I know about that, and every time I touch on a clinical opinion, I say my own clinical opinion is worthless, but I think it was balance of risk, and I understand why they did that, because they obviously did not realise that I think a score now is almost 3,000 people were eventually, sadly, going to die. If they'd known that, they would have stopped Factor VIII straight away. I mean, and as I said, they and the ministers would have faced a storm of abuse and campaigning and complaint that we'd stop giving this wonder treatment, which so improved the quality of life of haemophiliacs. But with the hindsight, that would have been justified because they would have saved thousands of lives. You've referred to medical knowledge at the time, Lord Clark. Um, uh, would this be a fair or unfair comment that your grasp at the time of the contemporaneous medical knowledge was limited? Yeah, I, I say my own clinical opinions are worthless. What I'm talking about is the advisory committees, the experts, the, what any health ministry in any developed country can do, and what the Department of Health does is it draws on the best advice available from the medical profession. That's what all these expert advisory committees are for. Again, following COVID, I imagine the countless doctors from academics and whatever, are called in to give advice, and it's all pulled, and they don't all agree with each other, but the, 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 the ministers today say, well, they do what we all did in the 1980s, act in the light of the best scientific and medical advice we can obtain. And I've not been shown anything, which tells me that the, uh, the world-class medics giving us that advice got it wrong in the light of what they knew at the time. They just did not predict. We, they, I think well, probably what no one predicted was just how infected and contaminated the American supplies of Factor VIII were. That's what caused this horrific sort of death and, you know, 
an illness rate that the hemophiliacs in particular suffered. And we, you know, and, and, and I, I don't know, I know less about the hepatitis and the infections from the blood transfusion. We haven't covered that very much. But, but I mean, there's the, the, the instance of that, again, we acted once we had a test that worked in, in taking samples of the donor's blood. But you have to have a test that's safe and which works first. And that's not a political question. It's nothing to do with polit politicians like me. That's a question for scientists and medics. And you must call the scientists and the medics and ask them to explain, the ones that are still alive, why they came to the judgment they did. I'm sure they'll be quite satisfactorily able to do so. You haven't shaken my confidence in the medical and scientific advice we were receiving in the slightest. Um, Lord Clark, I don't want to, um, in my next question, I don't want to ask you to go into any of the discussions that may have taken place between you and your legal team, which are what's called, as you will know, as a lawyer, privilege. Yes, as you will be both. But can I ask you this? When you signed your statements, had you personally read all of the many documents sent to you and referred to in your statement, or were you relying on summaries of the documents as set out in your witness statement? Oh, I read a lot. I mean, in some cases, I, I, to be fair, what happened was, <laughs> and I can't do this, as you say, we were in detail, but we didn't do it. I mean, I assure you, the, the, the people advising me are reputable, very good lawyers. We, we didn't break any, any of the conduct rules or anything of that no, kind. They, they weren't that. schooling no, me. I, 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 I explained to them what I explained to you about my involvement. And I, my first inclination was to answer the vast majority of the questions. Can't remember, don't think I was involved. But we, they persuaded me, and I think they were right, to be as helpful as I could be. So they, they certainly went through the documents, and they extracted documents which they thought were relevant to the questions, partly to see if it prompted my memory, and partly to remind me that I had been involved in things like the drafting of these leaflets, which has loomed so large uh, in our discussions. Um, and then, to be helpful, we set out references to the documents. We quote them occasionally. But as with every document, going back to my time as minister, every time I answered a PQ, every time I replied to a letter, by the time I put my name to it, I agree with that. That's my answer. It may have been drafted for me by somebody else, but I would alter it if I didn't like it. In fact, we, talked, we spent hours going over it, so I think they genuinely got the gist of what it was I wanted to say. But what we now have is my, uh, it's my answer, but the initial draft of the replies and the research going through the documents, that was done by the government uh, legal team which have been allocated to me to advise me in all this. But in the end, I read everything I felt I had to read so that I felt confident that I could approve it and say, this is my personal statement. Um, you, you've queried on, I think, more than one occasion why, the relevance of questions you were being asked or why you were being asked questions. In both of the um, detailed letters sent to you by the inquiry setting out lists of questions, you were sent... Uh, or, or, or provided with a link to or sent a copy of the inquiry's terms of reference. Did you ever read the inquiry's terms of reference? I'm not sure I ever did. I mean, I did answer quite a lot of it. There quite a lot of the questions. I have hundreds of questions. There were questions I, re I, I, I just wouldn't reply to. I mean, there's a lot of the questions I just said, I can't help on this. It's nothing to do with me. So far this morning, I mean, the questioning we've had for the first hour is entirely on the subject matter, which I had nothing to do with the eventual decision of. Absolutely nothing to do with it. Settlement of the legal action. And, and by the time it was settled, I mean, the negotiations, the settlement, they had nothing to do with me. I wasn't involved. I, if I knew what had happened, it was because I read in the newspapers uh, of the outcome. It, 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 we, we've spent and that is indeed most of this morning Clark, with you questioning me about And that, that is why, indeed, Lord Clark, I haven't asked you a single question about the settlement of the legal action. Yeah, precisely. But you all the, the background, who said what to who, about whether we might settle or all the rest of it. We spent yet another hour on that. 
It doesn't matter. The, 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 the preliminaries going on between me and Norman Lamont before the real negotiation started, I, it's the inquiry to decide, not me, I must admit, but I cannot see what the, to, it's, got, it's got to do with anything uh, when you look, put it in against the big issue of this inquiry, which is what lessons are to be learned and what could perhaps be done in future, minimizing the risk of the human tragedy, the illness and death this disease causes. We, we, we're 12 o'clock now, and I spent all morning not being asked about anything I was responsible for. Th th that is your view, Lord Clark, is clear. I'm going to now ask you um, a number of questions that I have been asked to ask of you by core participants to the inquiry. Sorry? I am now going to be asking you a number of questions that I've been asked to ask you by no, core participants. No, I understand that. I understand that process, yes. Uh, you may not so be able I, to... I stop complaining to you about that, the question. That, that would be of enormous assistance, Lord <laughs> right. um, 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 it Maybe you can't answer some of them, but I'm going to ask them. Um, the first relates to um, Northern Ireland. What um, was the structure in place for the conveyance of Department of Health decisions in relation to blood products or indeed other medical matters to Northern Ireland? I don't know. I think it will probably follow that you can't answer the second question, but for the sake of clarity, I'm going to ask it. Do you know who were the individuals who would have been involved in relation to providing information to or receiving information at no. Northern Ireland? Amongst my 8,000 officials or 6,000 officials, uh, I just don't know who did that. During the eight... So, because these questions come from a number of sources, Lord Clark, they're going to I, dot I, around... I, no, I, I do understand. Okay. So they're going to dot around from topic to topic rather than following no, no, I understand that. at any one I, time. I that. During the HIV litigation process, did you ever have any discussions about the potential for claims arising uh, in respect of infection with non-A, non-B hepatitis, or hepatitis C, as it became known? I don't think so. I, I but I say I was never involved in the actual negotiations. They started after I'd left. Um, you've referred, um, in the context of your evidence about the donor, AIDS donor leaflets, you've referred on a number of occasions to scaremongering press coverage as a, a factor for both your involvement and having to take time and care to get the wording of the leaflet and associated publicity right. Do you know whether anyone within the department thought about talking to responsible newspapers, the, the BBC, for example, um, to seek their help in promoting the government's positive public health uh, Well, well the, the press office would do that sort of thing, and I'm sure the press office were doing their best. Uh, and, and, and I, I can't remember the BBC. I don't know what the BBC did. Um, it, 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 was, it was, I'm afraid, the tabloid press. I can't name individual newspapers, but... I mean, I'm only, I, only, I, obviously I can't remember now what they, they said, but we've cited in the documents we've cropped up, gay blood kills patients was the way. Now, you and I, I'm sure everybody would agree, that is a rather stark summary of what the leaflet said uh, or anybody else has ever said. Uh, it was, in those days... Uh, a lot of the public were very prejudiced against homosexuals. It was uh, deeply disapproved of, and it was, uh, most homosexuals didn't come out. It was a deep sense of guilt and shame they were made to feel for being homosexuals. So it was partly tabloid newspaper attacks on, on homosexuals uh, and f scaremongering. Uh, and we, 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 we couldn't control it. It's a free press. I die in the last ditch to defend a free press, but they can irritate you all the time. And we had to try to present it so that we minimised that kind of tone, because as I keep saying, that I did not want the donors starting to be worried about coming forward, did not want members of the public frightened to have that operation they needed, because it, they got gays were giving blood that was going to kill them or give them an illness if they had the operation. Do, do you accept more broadly in terms of the provision of information to the public, that sometimes the government has a responsibility to communicate to the public uncertainty about a public health threat. That's what we did. Do you accept that where there is scientific uncertainty, the public, and in particular any cohort of patients who may be particularly affected, needs to be told what is known for sure, 
what is considered likely and what is thought to be possible? Well, uh, we, we've seen the words that were actually used. I mean, everybody gets excited by taking three words out of what we said, no conclusive proof. So I, I, I'm sorry to keep repeating myself as the questions are so repeat, uh, uh, not from you, but that, 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 that uh, great Neil's made about no, no conclusive proof. What does that mean? It, it quite clear, particularly in context of the leaflets we were issuing and the things we were saying, that means there's a very strong possibility that people are getting it, as it targets by it, may even be a probability, but we're not certain, we're not sure. Now, that, that's, I suppose that is the form of words I'm using now. I can't remember whether that form of words like was used at the time, but that is the kind of message we're trying to get out. Because it was a new disease, because this was a new problem, that's, that's how these tragedies occur. There was genuine uncertainty. Nobody was, nobody was, none of the, the best medics you could find weren't certain what the position was. That only eventually became clear as you got more data and as the numbers began to pile up. Is the answer to my question yes? <laughs> I spoke for so long, I've forgotten exactly what The question was this, to and I'm not asking you again about the specific line to take or yes. what was said in the leaflets. It's the general principle. Do you accept that where there is scientific uncertainty, the public, and in particular cohorts of patients who may be direct, most directly affected, need to be told what is known for sure, what is thought to be likely, and what is recognised as a possibility? If you can do that, yes, that's one way of doing it. That's just a suggested way of drafting it. I don't think anything was known for sure. Um, during the months um, or the period of time when the leaflets were under consideration, uh, the aim of which was to, in part, to um, prevent the NHS blood from not being contaminated with AIDS. Do you, did you ever challenge the department's medical advisors to tell you what the plan would be for treating people with haemophilia if the NHS factor eight turned out to be contaminated with AIDS. The, the, uh, my recollection is the advice we were given was that there was no way we could be so we could we could replace the American. We would not be self-sufficient. Uh, the reason we were, the re, I mean, as soon as we uh, what concerns were started to be expressed about the American blood donors, I'm sure we would have switched to another supply. Well, I know we would have switched to another supply of factor eight if such a thing was available. Now, I'm, I'm quite sure the background to everything we've been talking about was the advice to us, and I have no reason to doubt that it's correct, was that we, you know, we needed factor eight in order to meet the demand from the doctors who wanted to prescribe it to their patients. So the, my question was slightly different from that. Did you ever say to the medical advisors, and, and if you didn't, do you think you should have done, um, um, what, what, what will happen? I, I, was, I was told... Of, sorry, Lord Clark, can I ask the question? What would happen in terms of the treatment of people with haemophilia? What, what are the possible range of alternatives? I, I, was, told, no, I, was, I, 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 I was I left no, the impression no, there was no, no effective... There was no, no effective alternative. Uh, as I've repeatedly said, you've asked me this question many times, I, I was left with the firm impression, this was the, must have been the medical advice I was given, that you would shorten the life expectancy of the haemophiliacs and the quality of their life would deteriorate and that they, they would be bitterly resistant to doing that. Indeed, as we've seen, the Haemophilia Society, for some reason, got involved uh, and was opposed to stopping factor eight, even in the light of what was emerging about the American supply. Did you manage to ask the whole of your question there? I think sufficiently. Uh, it, it would help, I think, if uh, neither of you talks over the other. <laughs> OK. Um, in relation to the AIDS leaflet, um, and I'm not talking again about the process by which it was drafted or, or its precise the content, content or its content, um, uh, uh, but one of the matters mentioned in the leaflet is about blood donors tested positive being given counselling. Was consideration ever given by the department during your time there to the provision of counselling to people with haemophilia who were infected? I, I don't know. I don't know. In your evidence yesterday, you said this. Um, you said that a government department facing litigation should, other things being equal, take the advice of, of counsel, take its lawyers, and pursue it. 
unless there's something particularly unpleasant about the course of action you're being urged to take. And you, you gave that answer in the context of being asked about decisions on which arguments to run in the defence of the haemophilia litigation. Given the circumstances of the HIV haemophilia claim and the, the circumstances of those bringing it, was it not unpleasant to rely on technical legal points on the duty of care and limitation? No, because the f future liability of the government, health service and the doctors would be affected if we established a precedent for not using a legal defence which was open to you. Uh, I, I mean, the, the law is the law, uh, and I don't think it was... I mean, no, I, I, I just think if counsel thought there was a, a reasonable prospect of success by arguing a valid legal point should be argued, I don't think, I don't think anything unpleasant was done, as uh, far as I'm aware, in the litigation so far as uh, this HIV was concerned. Um, was consideration, through this goes back to the AIDS leaflet, was consideration ever given to making the leaflet, which contained information of, of relevance not just to donors but potentially to people who would receive blood or blood products, um, to making the leaflet available to uh, patients with haemophilia? Um. I, I don't think so. I don't know. I, I'm not aware of any. Uh, it did, doesn't seem to arise. Uh, but did you ever question or challenge the assertion? Belief it was aimed at donors. No, I, I understand that that was what it, who it was aimed at. It was just a question about whether consideration was given to its use more broadly. I think you've answered that. Did Lord? Did you ever question or challenge? the assertion or belief that people would die without factor eight concentrate? No, it wasn't as simple as that. No, no, I didn't. Again, I'm in no position to start challenging the legal advice from people who are regarded as experts in the field. I think you mean clinical advice rather than... Uh, clinic, advice. Yes, well, clinical expert advice is a, it's a true of other expert advice you get. You, you don't substitute yourself for your expert. No, I did not challenge it. Did you ever ask... But, it, it, well, it, but I think it, well, I've got in my head, I mean, it's trying to remember what I was advised and what I thought almost 40 years ago, um, was it, it had made a huge difference to the life expectancy, which means some haemophiliacs, would, presumably, therefore, would indeed die earlier than they'd otherwise die if you stopped giving them factor A did, as did, a prophylactic. Did you ever ask what treatment was provided to haemophiliacs prior to the advent of factor VIII concentrates and whether that treatment was still available? No, I, I know nothing about that at all. Um, did, did, and this is in the context of considerations of financial redress, compensation, ex gratia payments, however you want to term them, did the government ever seek or consider seeking redress from the pharmaceutical companies that had supplied the contaminated blood products? I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, I, see, I think somewhere in the documents there's some dispute with some company where we rejected this. Oh, I did have contaminated supplies and rejected it, didn't we? But I don't think I knew anything about that at the time. I'm just going to something I glanced at. Yes, I think that's a documents. slightly separate issue. Yeah, I mean, that's just something that has nothing to do with me. It's, I, no, I, I, I don't know is the answer. Um, in, in terms of public inquiries, you said, I think as well as you're making, I think, your views known um, more generally about the, the uh, merits of public inquiries, you've said that you didn't have public inquiries uh, when you were Secretary of State for Health. Um, it's, it's been pointed out to me, and I've been asked to point out to you, that there were a number of public oh, inquiries Oh, occasionally, I mean, you know, bridge collapses, and I'm sure there are. Yes, but what I, I say was, with this, this sort of public inquiry, which is in response to newspaper and other campaigning, uh, and and, and it, it, it is, is, you know, being dealt with by a government and is referred to. And these inquiries that take years and years uh, and, and come back later, that, that, that has all developed since my day. We didn't do that. Uh, I, I once acted as counsel to a health inquiry uh, when I was in practice. It was an inquiry into the failure and collapse of the Solihull Health Authority, and it demonstrated to me then, as I was doing what you're doing, I was counsel to the tribunal, then the whole management system had collapsed, and it was that, before I became a minister, 
revealed to me how useless this consensus management system was and what the dangers. Uh, that took two weeks. And uh, I had two or three conclusions, and that was all over. Um, by way of example only, the Piper Alpha inquiry was established a week after the disaster by the Secretary of State for Energy. You said in the course of your evidence, uh, and I think speaking not with hindsight, but, but um, incompletely, but this was, that this was a tragedy um, that hit thousands of people. Why did you not order a public inquiry? Uh, well, because nobody had raised anything that seemed to add to the sum of knowledge we already had. It, 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 there just wasn't pressure for inquiries in those days. Anything anybody ever asked for a public inquiry? Uh, and it, it's they are being called more and more frequently now. This is the, this is the, this is unique. This particular one, because it's the first time we've had one. I think, and you you immediately find an example and prove me wrong. But this is just a personal opinion. I, I've never known one set up to inquire into events between 30 and 40 years ago, when a, a high proportion of the key players are actually dead. Um, uh, that is, the people who took the decisions. I, 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 I'm going to resist the temptation to comment, um, Lord Clark. Um, um, in terms, my privilege when I give answers, yes. In terms of um, uh, ordering or, or, or give, contemplating a public inquiry, at least when you were um, Secretary of State for Health or indeed when you were a member of the government over the, the period of time that followed, was there a reluctance or reticence to order an inquiry which would examine the government's own actions or inactions? No, I don't think anybody asked us to call an inquiry, or if they did, I don't think anybody then thought it was suitable. What are we going to inquire into? What are we going to find out? We don't know already. As I said, the words, I have been two inquiries. At the, there was a Scottish one. I'm not sure it was set up by the Scottish government. I can't remember who held them now. There were two. Lord Penrose and Lord Archer. Yeah, they both approached me, and I would have given evidence if they'd asked. But neither of them, in the end, thought it was necessary for me to give evidence. Uh, and I never gave evidence, but, but they, they were. I, I, I do really don't remember, so it's really me to correct me for answer, exactly what their status was and exactly who set them up. But there were two independent inquiries which came to the conclusion that, 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 that they couldn't find any fault anywhere. I, I'm not going to debate with you, Lord Clark. No, I, 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 I'm quite right to be wrong. I'm making, and you're quite right to correct me. I'm sitting here off the cuff giving my recollection of events which I was aware of 20 years ago, so I, I, I may well have garbled that. I, I apologise. Um, you, 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 you talked um, in the course of your evidence about AIDS taking you by surprise. Given the risks of viral transmission, in particular hepatitis B and non-A, non-B hepatitis, and, and the, the it, it was a well-known... Um, uh, consequence of the use of blood that there might be viral transmission. Why did a, a new virus take you by surprise as an issue with blood products? Well, I'm sure it took me by surprise. Because it, 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 uh, you can't, until it turns up, you, you don't know what the new one is. And, and, and as I said, HIV AIDS was unfortunately quite spectacular. Uh, new condition which turned up. As you say, it's a constant problem. I don't know how far heat treatment has totally eliminated it. The, the great medical breakthrough at the time was the beginning, was heat treatment, which had that happened five years earlier would have saved very many lives. Um, I think he hepatitis is, is not the problem it was. Is it, uh, I know it's not vanished hepatitis, but I think heat treatment did a great deal to reduce that. Um, were, were you do, doing the best you can, Lord Clark, uh, um, in, in the period 82 to 85 when you were Minister of State for Health, do you think you were aware that viral hepatitis could be rapidly fatal or cause long-term liver damage? Uh, probably. I knew, I knew hepatitis B and C were serious, serious diseases, yes. It, I think most, I mean, that, as a layman, I think I knew that. In, in, in terms of the circumstances in which matters did or did not get drawn to ministerial attention um, by, by civil servants, would it be fair, looking at the events with which your evidence has been concerned, to say that ministers mainly became involved in matters, either when they involved the possibility of adverse public reaction or press content, comment, 
or when they involved issues of significant public expenditure? Well, the, 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 when, when the government's taking a decision, the minister's asked to clear it, but if it entirely depends on the advice of, uh, say, a clinical committee, obviously the minister just, just checks, there doesn't seem anything wrong with this, and clears it. it, it the, the ministers get involved when some ministerial knowledge or, or decision seems to be required, and that's a judgment made by the officials who put up the submissions. Uh, it, it is true that uh, in the health service, cost, who's got, how we're going to pay for it, is something that the ministers used to get involved in. And it was my fate when I was, uh, you know, my, <laughs> my unlucky role in life, when I happened to be Minister of State, that actually de dealing with, trying to, you know, look after, keep them within budget and deliver as many of our priorities as possible, I often did get involved when it came to the bit of how exactly we're going to pay for this. And again, I'd be advised that the expert officials who would put proposals to me, but that's the kind of thing where I get drawn in. And it's in this case, I obviously got drawn in once or twice on that basis. You said it's it mainly how do we pay for it, because there's no choice in spending money on this. We had to spend the money. You, you, you where do we find it from? I used to get involved in. You said in your evidence on Tuesday... Um, I think an answer to the effect that the blood transfusion service, uh, you described it as a relatively calm area, um, an oasis of calmer words to that effect, and, and a low priority and hence given to the parliamentary undersecretary of state in the Lords. Given the importance of the blood transfusion service to national health and the knowledge that it could transmit deadly viruses, why was the blood transfusion system treated as a low priority in terms of ministerial responsibility? Because the safety, I mean, obviously, as you say, the safety, as with most healthcare, safety was paramount. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't, again, as I keep saying, it wasn't for ministers that required clinical management on the ground to deliver it as safe as possible. It was, a, compared with most of the health service, it was a smooth running, uncontroversial, unchanging most of the time part of the service, so well, they had to be given the highest priority uh, for uh, whoever was managing it, as far as the medics responsible for it were concerned. It, it, it very rarely provoked any minister need for ministerial intervention. It could be just left run on its own by the people who knew what they were doing. And uh, this uh, obviously rapidly changed from being that, and we had a real, real crisis. Uh, in the blood products, but no one saw it coming. Um, you'll recall, Lord Clark, in relation... Uh, at, at, the, at the time that the AIDS leaflet was being considered, one of the other questions or issues that arose was um, the, the, the possibility of questioning people about their donors about their, their personal life, their sex life, or, or, or sexual practices. Um, um, what, what, how would asking people about their sexual practices in order to prevent those deemed to be at high risk of AIDS from donating blood be homophobic, sorry, be, and then this is a quote from your evidence, being homophobic for the sake of it, as you suggested it might have been? Well, it would give the impression we were getting homophobic. We had, we had to make it clear what we were doing. Um, as it, again, nearly 40 years ago, and, and our culture is totally changed on this subject. Uh, I'm sure we had, you know, the same proportion of the population were homophobic and straight then as is now. For, for a high, high proportion of homosexuals in the 1980s, it was a dark secret, unknown to anybody but their own family and the people they were emotionally involved with. It was not a subject that they would cheerily go along to be a blood donor and then want to sit down and have some official start quizzing them about their sexual predilections. Uh, and it would arouse fears. I mean, that it was ne no one doubted that we needed to put this leaflet out. No one challenged, no one was challenging that we needed to stop taking gay blood. It was how you went about it where you had to be sensitive. 
And if every blood donor is going to be sit, sat down and be challenged, are you secretly gay, you know, in the climate of the 1980s, that would have been rather daunting. It was just a question of handling a very, very difficult issue as sensitively as possible. Um, um, what assessment, if any, was done of the likely impact on the level of blood donation uh, of greater questioning about sexual practices? I don't know. I don't think we... We probably didn't even know quite how many would turn out to be gay and how many donors we'd lose. Was consideration given, as far as you can recall, to the possibility of taking other measures uh, like public education or encouraging additional low-risk donors who might not otherwise have donated? I don't know. I, I, I think the, the, the very fact of producing the leaflet was, was... I mean, that gave the message that it was, it was, quite, a, it was quite a drastic step to take to suddenly start rejecting perfectly law-abiding, you know, normal, responsible citizens because of their sexual uh, predilections. Uh, that in itself flagged up, I think, that we, re we were taking a serious problem seriously. What, what other methods... Of, and again, the problem with disseminating information was to avoid it being taken up, causing some silly panic. Who was it, um, do you think... Uh, if you're able to recall, who told you or provided you with information about the life expectancy of haemophiliacs? Oh, I can't remember who said what I mean, for all these years. No, I can't remember. Uh, um, who, who is it? I mean, my guess is the chief medical officer, but it might be somebody who was working for him. Um, and in terms of uh, your understanding that factor eight... I mean, is that wrong? I mean, I still to this day, I mean, I you may gather, I keep repeating it because I still believe that. No one's ever told me that's not correct. N n not for me to answer the questions, Lord Clark, no, well, you, upon which you the may chair be, You has... cheerily allowed me to keep answering in what is, I was advised at the time, and what I, as far as I'm aware, but I've not, obviously not done any research on it, uh, continues to be the case, I don't know. The, the chair has the benefit of a range of evidence on the topic and will no doubt make findings in due course. Uh, you're not going to tell me what the up-to-date medical advice is? I'm, I'm not, no, but there's plenty right, of material okay. available publicly, Lord Clark. Well, in that case, I shall continue to believe and, um, that it reduces their life expectancy. Sure, you can ask Can we move on to the next advice? question, yes. please? Yes. Who told you, if you're, uh, and maybe it's the same answer, Lord Clark, about, or where did you get your understanding that Factor Eight was a wonder treatment? I, 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 again, I can't remember who told me that, and I, I'm probably using my, my own words. Uh, but it had rapidly, I think, and I don't know what happened in the 70s, so again, I begin this by saying you'll probably correct me that I've, after all this time, uh, I haven't remembered totally accurately, but my, 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 I think my vague understanding was that it had been introduced in the 70s that it had started being used as a prophylactic in the late 1970s uh, and, uh, and it had, as I think I've said several times, had, had hugely improved the quality of life of most haemophiliacs uh, uh, and, you know, had been extremely beneficial in alleviating some of the consequences of this, you know, very, very serious and appalling health condition. That was what I believed had happened. And it... it any suggestion that we might stop importing blood products or stop giving them would be quite tricky for the doctors to take, but I'm not sure they didn't mind that. The fact was that the advice was uh, that we should not... Uh, the doctors should were, were going to carry on uh, using it because the, the, of the consequences of not outweighed the worrying possibility that some people might be affected with AIDS. Um, Lord Clark, you've told us, um, in both in your written statement and your oral evidence, that uh, both in your capacity as Minister of State for Health and when you were Secretary of State for Health, your primary focus, or one of your primary focuses, was on making changes to the National Health Service which delivered better outcomes for patients. Um, did the extent to which patients could or should be engaged and involved in decisions about them and their treatment form part of that work? No, because I, I, well, I was talking about there mainly there are mainly changes to the structure of the health service. So you have to know something. So I, 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 it wouldn't involve the average patient in changes to the management of the health 
uh, care system, which is a hugely complex and complicated issue, and always controversial, and remains so to this day. Although the reforms I introduced were followed by subsequent governments and have never yet been dropped. I mean, the Blair government developed my health reforms, took them much further, you know, it was exactly the same basis they did. Uh, they, they, just, they just completed the job of implementing the reforms. Where the patient involvement is absolutely crucial, uh, and it's taken more seriously today even than it was then, but it was key to the medics then, was patient consent to the treatment and in my opinion, with a good doctor, that means informed consent. So you explain to the patient what the pros and cons are and the risks. It's the doctor who informs the patient as to, you, before getting the patient's informed consent that, that enables the treatment to go ahead. Now, I say for a variety of reasons, I think that is now Taken, taken further by doctors than it always was in the 1980s. Some of, some of the old veteran grand consultants, but the, the, no, I won't go on. I mean, I think probably didn't take this, take this quite as far as the, their successors would nowadays. Just going back to your description of the blood products area of responsibility as an oasis of calm, um, um, uh, uh, did the department take its eye off the ball when it came to the safety of blood products because of this perception? Because of? Because of the perception that it was an oasis of calm and low priority area. No. It, well, once we started getting worried uh, about the source of our blood products, it was no longer an area of calm. That's, what, that's why people like me started getting involved in it, I mean, on the fringes of it and parts of it. And no, 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 plainly, obviously, no, it's, it ceased. As I, Simon Glen Arthur, I'm sure, will have told you it was not an oasis of calm in his time. It was certainly a, it was a very, very, you know, problematic area. And at the point but we'd in never, time... I don't think we'd had anything like that in blood transfusion and, and, and history before, but I don't know. You'll immediately find something in the 50s, which I don't know about. At the point in time at which it became apparent that there was a... a, a, a it, it was no longer an oasis of calm, d did you consider... Um, uh, transferring responsibility for this area of, of, of ministerial activity to somebody more senior? No, well, I don't think I did. Because, as I say, we did have that touch base meeting at least once with Simon. I had the utmost confidence in Simon, and he tried out on me. And I gather the job pattern as well. The one that he definitely recalls, and that it's all falls into place as exactly as I recall it. I, 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 I mean, it, I had every confidence in Simon. Had I had a party sec who was very green, inexperienced, or I thought was slightly out of their depth on all this, or getting uh, over, you know, couldn't handle it, was getting a bit stressed by it, all the rest of it, I couldn't take move responsibilities, but I might have suggested to my bo our mutual boss, Norman Fowler, do you think we should get Simon out of this? But I, I hasten to add, at no stage did I lose my trust and confidence in Simon. And I, as I sit here today, having had to go through, you know, processes, all this process of improving my knowledge of the thing vastly beyond any I've ever had before, uh, as far as the documents can give you that knowledge, I, I continue to think I don't see what Simon's supposed to have done wrong. He was perfectly capable of handling it, and he, the one thing you can't accuse him of being, he's, he's not as combative as I am, he's a, he, he's a very calm, you know, he, very, very responsible uh, man, he, he has very high standards, he takes his responsibilities seriously, he's an intelligent man, I think his judgment was very sound, and I as I sit here today, nothing I've read has, or heard has shaken my confidence that Simon was handling it uh, as well as anyone could handle it, given all the clinical and other uncertainties that surrounded the problem. So I think since the break, there may have been some further questions suggested to me that I haven't had an opportunity to look at. Um, uh, it may not take very long, but I, I don't yet know. So I'm in your hands as to whether we take lunch and come back afterwards or we just take a very short break now. Well, I, I, you, I think... You may have um, questions, sir, and um, I haven't yet checked with Miss Gray whether she has. Uh, I, I, I 
shall ask Lord Clark whether he'd rather, uh, as it were, soldier on uh, in the... I, I've been quite happy to soldier on since we started, so I think another long half-hour break. I don't, I'll don't. just sit here, if you like. I, mean, I quite understand uh, that Council has to uh, but take a few moments to do this. It depends how long she thinks it's going to take. Shall, shall we see how long she thinks it may, it may take for her to consider... Um, the well, I'll just shut up for ten it. minutes, if you like, and just sit here. Yes, if I could just read them. We may be relieved by that. only going to take me five minutes or so, sir. It's going to take you five minutes or yes. so. No, no, well, no, no rush. Um, I mean, you, would you prefer to take a break? I don't mind at all. If you uh, prefer I, I us to go I, away and take a break, I don't, I'm not objecting to it. Can I, can I suggest this? What we'll do is we'll take a, a short break. You, you're very welcome to use the, the room uh, here, uh, Lord Clark, in the meantime, because it, I think it'll be, what, quarter of an hour? Uh, not as long as that. Ten minutes? T ten minutes is ample. OK. Well, let, let's, let's take a break and, and come back at, at one o'clock uh, in the expectation that it's, the questions are going to be fairly short. If, if you, they're not, uh, then we'll pass the message through to everyone that they can have a, a, a lunch. So let, let's, let's do that. Ten minutes. <laughs> 